glad to have the opportunity to talk to you. I don't often get to meet master's students. I don't know why. So most of the stuff that I do is with undergraduates. Uh, so it's a rare opportunity for me. Uh, plus, I don't know how many of you are going to do a thesis, but perhaps this will inspire some of you to choose a certain path in the thesis um, to contemplate some of the things that are happening in science right now and see that you have the opportunity to affect that, to join something that might resolve some of these issues. So I call for a science reform. There's a few in that uh, movement that try to improve the way that we do science. There are all sorts of challenges. Today, I will mostly go over the challenges. Uh, it might seem a little bit pessimistic at times, but at the end of the session, I will actually tell you what we're doing about this with an invitation for you to also uh, take part in this. If you want, most of my talks, workshops, everything is on YouTube. Uh, I affiliate myself with the open science movement, which means that everything that I do, including these slides and the video that we're recording is going to be shared. So if there's something that you're uh, missing that you want to go back to and look at, or if you want to expand your knowledge about open science, meta research, everything that we do here at HKU, then you can check out the YouTube. So I don't think you need me to tell you that right now in the world, we're facing some pretty big challenges. I feel like every generation has these challenges, but now we've really created this situation for ourselves where there's a lot of big challenges happening at the same moment right now, and it's going to be up to you, unfortunately, <laughs> to solve this. You know, uh, I feel a little bit sad that my generation or the generation before uh, failed you. So all sorts of things that we see around the world, Pakistan, a lot of it is underwater right now. Uh, major climate changes, there's a bunch of risks that uh, the world is facing, a lot of uncertainty. There's a pandemic, which uh, we're not sure, is it ending, we're coming out of it. Uh, are we ready to cope with these sort of things? And what has become clear is that we need science in order to address this. Never in the history of um, the world, the universe, have we been able to produce vaccines. Well, to address a certain crisis, so within one year, uh, mRNA and so forth. Um, but it seems to be like the problem was not entirely science, it was us and the way that we implement science, the way that we implement the practicality of solutions. So we need to depend on science. The problem is that science involves us humans and we're fallible, we have weaknesses. So uh, we want to ensure as much as possible that our implementation of science and our ability to use science is good, is optimized, is efficient, uh, that what we do is, is based on credible, optimized science. How is science doing? I'll start with an example, not from my field. So both of us are a little bit in social psychology. This is a psychology class, I imagine. Uh, I'll start with cancer biology. This is one of the biggest projects that we undertook as the open science community, the science reform movement. And we decided uh, back then in the beginning of uh, 2011, 12, to start to replicate 193 experiments. We wanted to know if we can reproduce, replicate, and then come to the same conclusions as the original findings. We wanted to know whether the foundations of the science in cancer biology are solid. We started from 193 experiments. We uh, started to conduct uh, 87 of those, but we only completed 50. Why? Have you tried to read an article in psychology or an article in cancer biology? Not a lot of details in there. Are we able to really reproduce, understand which scales, what is the procedure, who was this conducted on, what time, in what order? very difficult to try and get that information and when we contact the authors can you please tell us what did you do in that article the authors are like sorry we don't know laptop was stolen uh, we don't really know what happened back then it was a long time ago things have you know memory deteriorated we changed universities a lot of reasons why started from 193 but only able to complete 50 
Okay, so we have 50, not 193. How many of those are successfully reproduced, successfully replicated? So this is a summary from one of the leaders in the science reform movement to fighting for open access. This is his summary of the entire situation. So 2013, we said, let's try and replicate 50. Okay, not 193. Uh, sorry, we're only able to do 18 out of those. So reproduction rate is 18 out of the 50. How many successfully replicated with similar or uh, partial full results? Five out of 18 out of 50 out of 193. Five are full replication, seven partial replication, six not even like in the right direction. So what does this mean? This is supposedly an exact science, a hard science. If things don't work in my research, judgment, decision-making, social psychology, you can argue, not a big deal. We can have this kind of debate. But cancer biology, if we don't have the right treatments for cancer, people get hurt, people die. So we want to make sure that we have these things right, accurate, credible. How big are these issues? So they're very big. Uh, I've been spending uh, a lot in the past five years to try and map this out. We first noticed uh, these problems being very big in 2011, and I'll share some case studies with you. How did we know that this is happening? When did we see some issues? And I'm glad to say that psychology, and specifically social psychology, started this uh, science reform movement to try and tell everybody this is not a psychology problem or a social psychology problem. This is a problem with science. So we started with a lot of replications in 2011. 2015, some of the other domains started to do replications. And then these headlines started to come out. Very troubling. So no, the science uh, reproducibility replication problem is not limited to psychology. We have this in medicine. We have this in chemical research. We have this in economics. I just told you about some of the very sad findings in cancer biology, even in the fields that seem to be very close to math. So math is kind of like the pure science, right? So even when we look at empirical computer science, it's supposed to be all code and very exact, very, very difficult to reproduce uh, things. And even in quantum mechanics and physics, we seem to have some issues with this. So this is not limited. To what it is that I'm going to discuss with you with case studies, this is a science problem and it's something that we need to know and address as fast as possible. Since I'm in social psychology, I'll share a little bit with what we've been doing. So ML1, ML2, this is many labs one, many labs two, where we decided we can't just do this one by one. I do this in my lab and then somebody else does this on something else in their lab. We need to collaborate. A little bit like the physicists doing CERN in Switzerland. We need to get social psychologists together to tackle these issues. So these are the findings from many labs one, many labs two, many labs three. And finally, the big boom, I think, in science was published in the journal Science, which is one of our highest impact factor, impact journal uh, in, in science overall. So it's got like nature, science, uh, these, these uh, groups of uh, of publishers. And then you can see that they try to do a hundred of these replications plus with all the many labs, what is the replication rate? In the ones that replicated, the effect size seems to be about half of what was originally published. Effect size means the impact, the, the influence of the manipulation when you compare the experimental versus the control. So half of what is uh, originally published for the ones that worked. Some people said maybe these social psychology journals, they're not very good, but if we go to science and nature, which are our best journals, according to a lot of people reputable in our field, maybe they will replicate better. Unfortunately not, 13 out of 21, and over there again, half. Over here, a mass replication effort, 14 out of 28. This is my summary after many replications, many groups of people from around the world getting together. A replication rate in social psychology seems to be about 30 to 50%. And in the things that replicate, it seems to be about half of the original effect size. 
some people say we didn't really expect very much. To me, this is very disappointing because I like to think of psychology, psychological science as a science. People say, no, in cancer biology, we didn't expect very much. It's academia. But when you go to the pharmaceutical companies, they can do things better. Can, can they really? We're going to talk a lot about bias. But to me, these are very disappointing findings. Seeing the cancer biology research just like knocks me out. So a lot of responses that I get when I talk about these things, for example, this is just psychology, so it's not just psychology. This doesn't affect me. If you consume science, if you're taking part in science, if you're studying psychology and want to know how to help your patients in therapy, how to help kids in educational, how to keep all of those things, you need credible science. Some people say, but I know that this research replicates. This research is solid. Then my question to you would be, how do you know? Did you conduct a replication, an independent, well-powered replication in many places around the world to make sure that this replicates? Most of us did not, and I'll talk about that. People say, but we have hundreds of replications, um, conceptual replications. We have hundreds of studies that are studying this. Therefore, it must be true. Unfortunately, that is not the case. And I'll give you some case uh, studies for why this is not. So we really need to re-examine all of these uh, things. Why is this happening? What's going on over here? <clears throat> we have misaligned incentives. I'm part of this system. You are also part of this system here at HKU. On one side, we have the incentives. And the incentives are for all sorts of things that are not aligned with seeking the truth. And we have strained researchers. I am under the system that in order to get hired, in order to get into a PhD, a postdoc, get a tenure track position, in order to get promoted to become an associate professor, you need to produce a lot of amazing findings, novel, groundbreaking findings in the top journals, the impact factor journals. So all these uh, things are in conflict and researchers don't really know what they should aim at. They're definitely not aiming for the most credible evidence possible. Some people say, but, you know, if you aim for high impact factors, then it means that you're aiming for credible research. No, this is not the case. We can't reproduce the way that impact factors are being calculated. They can be negotiated. And there's a lot of problems with how this is calculated. Two years, five years, what is included in these two years. If you want a takedown of impact factors, this is an amazing talk for you to listen to. And unfortunately, I apologize for this, but the publishing system is completely broken and we need to revisit the whole thing from the beginning. So we have four profit publishers that take your money. You're the ones who pay my salary. You're the ones who pay for my research. And then we peer review each other for free. And then we give all the IP, all the copyrights, we give this to a publisher that puts this behind a, a website that you need to pay money in order to access. So here's a bit of a demonstration. Hey, Christopher. Yeah, boss, what's up? What do you think about making some of our articles open access? That's a good idea. Make the articles free to the public so that anybody can appreciate the latest scientific advancements. I like it. Of course, the author would have to pay some kind of publishing fee. Yeah, OK, that's reasonable. What, like a couple hundred bucks? Yeah, I was thinking maybe $11,000. What? Yeah, $11,000, and we put your article on our website for anybody to read. Why so much? Oh, you know, all the, the costs. What costs? Uh, reviewing the article? Yeah, we don't pay reviewers. We guilt them into it because it's good for science. Okay, uh, what about formatting? Your 12-year-old niece does that for us. Well, we gotta publish it. That costs money. It's a PDF on a website. Kaylee does it in like two seconds. Kaylee? Your niece. Oh, yeah. Besides, who's going to be able to afford this? Oh, people will pay. Why? Because they have to. What do you mean? Researchers have to publish in order to keep their jobs or get promoted, and we're one of the most prestigious journals around. People will pay. So it's extortion. Here at Nature, 
we're doing crime. Oh, Christopher, don't be so dramatic. So let me get this straight. You want to charge researchers $11,000 to publish an open access article, thereby ensuring that only researchers with the most money get to publish an article, which defeats the purpose of having open access articles in the first place. Yeah, that's right. And this is guaranteed to be profitable because researchers' livelihoods are dependent on a predatory system that values publishing in high-impact journals. Hey, you got it. This, of course, is insane. It's academics, baby. We should be crying about this because this is our reality. So even when we try to force them to go into open access and say, we want to make sure that you can access the research that we're doing, we're being charged $11,000 in order to make this happen. They can charge whatever they want and we will pay. If you won't pay, you won't be able to access this. And then every time you want to download this, unless you're, of course, very fortunate to be HKU uh, elite students in the university, then it pays instead of you. So we pay hundreds of millions of Hong Kong dollars every year in order to get access to the studies that we did. This is really insane. It makes absolutely no sense, which is why, finally, the world is waking up a little bit. So the Europeans have been at it for a while. They're trying to do all sorts of stuff right now, but it's very controversial. Just from uh, the past month, the Biden administration in the US decided enough with this. So starting from 2026, everybody should be doing open, open access. So it's gonna be mandatory, plus forcing removal of paywalls. The problem is nobody knows how to implement this. Nobody knows how, whether this would go, is going to be implemented and who is going to finance this, which resulted in this reaction by uh, nature. So they decided that they're going to raise uh, their fees in order to address some of the... So if the government tries to do something, the publishers try to do something else. And this is a good example. Uh, a group in China that is aiming to promote computational psychiatry, which I think is very important in our region, publishing this in uh, Nature Human Behavior, some familiar faces over here. The problem is if you want to access this, you're gonna need to pay $32 uh, or if you want to get this to, you know, for you to be able to see this, you're gonna need $11,000, which re relates to this reaction by the publishers. Hey boss, I got a cool... Are you okay? Yes, Christopher. Why do you ask? Um, you're ripping out pages of a journal. Yeah, because it's worthless, Christopher. Okay, what's going on? The government has decided that we can't make people pay for research that was funded by the government. That's a bad thing? Yes, the entire academic publishing business model is making taxpayers pay for things they've already paid for. But that's so unnecessary that there's no reason for that business model to exist. Of course it's unnecessary. Look, you don't get on the cover of Middleman Monthly by being necessary. What are my fellow middlemen going to say when they hear I've been cut out? I don't know. That's the number one rule of being a middleman. You don't get cut out. I'm so sorry. I don't think you mean that. No. No, I don't. We've been gatekeeping academic research for far too long. Things need to change. Oh, don't be dramatic. We don't gatekeep research. Yes, we do. You even named the company softball team the gatekeepers. Well, if we can't profit off of publicly funded research, how are us lowly publishers supposed to make ends meet, Christopher? We make billions of dollars every year. I think we'll be okay. Yeah, for now. Within five years, our profit margins could go as low as Google. You know, this is a good thing for society. It gives the public more access to the latest scientific advancements. Well, I hope the public enjoys their free randomized controlled trials. Because I am about to create open access fees that are so egregious. It'll make United Healthcare blush. Yeah, and especially in a pandemic, we realize how devastating this thing is because we want to be able to disseminate the findings as fast as possible so that everybody can benefit from this. We are very privileged at HKU that we can access everything, but third world countries, developing countries, don't have the millions of dollars in order to make their stuff open access or access the stuff that we've 
that we, we've done. So really, they're parasites. We need to get rid of these parasites as much uh, as fast as possible and to the furthest extent. And we need to move to diamond, no fee, open access. We need to decrease our dependent, dependencies. Everything that they do, we can actually do better. And I'm going to give you a, a, one of the solutions that uh, we've, uh, not me personally, but uh, we submit to uh, one of the uh, solutions that have been implemented in the past year. Uh, the problem is, is that we still care about prestige. So if it was published in Nature and Science and cost whatever it is, $11,000 to publish, then we think it's more reputable. So we're supporting this, uh, this system. Plus, um, when I get to in a, in an invitation to do peer review, I don't review anything unless it has open data, open code, open materials. Uh, I refuse to take part in a trust system. So I really like this one. Uh, somebody says in a peer review, can you please review my research project? Sure, can you show me the work that you've done? Person says no. So I'm supposed to go over a summary, a very brief summary of the research, lend my credibility to say, yeah, I peer reviewed this, but then the person you know, doesn't even show me what the, the work is. So there's something also broken, forget the publishers for a bit. The way that we've created the peer review system, you just assume that if you've read this was peer reviewed, that this is credible, but has the person really looked at the data? Have they looked at the code? Have they really made sure? And we haven't, we haven't, most of us haven't. And this is how our peer review system works right now. A book was published in 2015 by Chris Chambers. Remember this name because we're going to come back to this name about seven deadly sins of psychology. Now we know this is not seven deadly sins of psychology. Now we know there is seven deadly sins of science. And we, we understand that we are, as researchers, uh, biased in all sorts of different ways. We have outcome bias. We judge the quality of the science based on whether uh, found support, p-value lower than 0 0.05 or not. And this is not how you evaluate science. You want to know whether something uh, works or not. And even if it's not working, let's say a vaccine doesn't work, you want to be able to see the evidence that it's not working. So this is publication bias, confirmation bias. We only seek to confirm what we think we already know. Hansard bias, we go back and interpret the past, uh, looking at the outcomes. So a lot of problems that we need to deal with. And now we know that in the scientific life cycle, these are, now we have credible meta uh, research that tells us just how bad things are. For example, we don't revisit our findings. How many replications are there for every uh, article? Only one in 1,000 papers gets replicated. 999 papers out of 1,000 do not ever get replicated. Somebody did something in the 1970s on a Princeton sample. And until now, we have this in the textbooks, and this is what you learn in your courses. Did somebody ever check that this is still applicable, 2022, that this is applicable to Hong Kong sample? No, because it was published back then in a, some prestigious high-impact journal. We need to make this a 1,000 out of 1,000, and we need to do more than one replication for each one of those. We use very low samples. I don't know what field you're in, but if you're in neuro, uh, baby related research samples are tiny because it's so time consuming. It's so expensive to do this kind of research. So very low, low power for the samples. We have a problem with questionable research practices. I'm gonna go back to this. Sometimes we look at the findings and it's not what we predicted. So we go back and pretend as if this is what we predicted all along, just to say, oh yeah, yeah, of course I knew this. This is what's gonna, even though this is not what you predicted and this was a complete surprise. And this breaks this cycle of how we should do science. I'm gonna give you uh, some case studies. When did we realize in social psychology that we have a problem? I think we had some unlikely findings before, which were we thought they were cool. So we reported these in the media and said, oh yeah, groundbreaking. But this one broke everything because this is an impossible uh, finding of Cornell University, one of the people who wrote the introduction to social psychology textbook, comes out with one paper that has nine experiments and a thousand participants showing that people react to something that's going to happen in the future. People have the ability to sense the future, an impossible finding. He was ar arguing for Psy, 
the phenomenon that people have some kind of sixth sense about what's going to happen. And he used some very clever techniques and uh, nine different experiments to show that this is the case. For us, this is the ultimate proof that if this found support, and something is very broken in the way that we do science. This, is, this cannot happen. And the problem is we looked at the findings. We even asked him, can you please show us the data? We want to have a look. What's going on over here? He shared it, looked at this. We couldn't find anything wrong with it, which made us realize maybe something about the way that we do statistics and science is wrong. What is the first thing that you do when you see this kind of thing, but you don't believe it? You try to replicate this. And a lot of people try to replicate this. Uh, the first attempt, I think, was, uh, yeah, Stuart Ritchie just came out with a book about this whole story. He tried to get this into the same journal, but failed, failed replication, showing that not even uh, uh, close to, to finding an effect. Then later, a bigger group was able to get this into the, the, the same journal, saying we can't find support for this, correcting a little bit of the, uh, the science uh, record. So we have, we have this problem that this is still out there. It is still published. It still gets cited. I don't know what this research means, but uh, it's a big problem for us. This is how things started for us. This is an example, a real example uh, of uh, a big, maybe you even heard of this. It's like somebody uh, did a study, a real study, about how eating chocolate can help you lose weight. So if you were worried, about your weight, no problem. Just eat a lot of chocolate from now on because then you're going to be very thin. And then the media really loved it. You know, there's a lot of uh, media attention of this blew up, went viral. All the big newspapers uh, did this. The person who did the study, who is a blogger, a reporter, wrote this uh, a little bit, a few months after this uh, all happened. I fooled millions into thinking that chocolate helps weight loss. Here is how. And this is a recipe, you don't need to be a reporter, you can be just like a, a thesis student or a faculty, you want to publish, you want to get your thesis done, you want to find something. This is how you do it, unfortunately. This is called p-hacking. Here's the dirty little science secret. If you measure a large number of things about a small number of people, you are almost guaranteed to get a statistically significant result. How did he do this? He had 18 different measures, only one of them was weight loss. He did a bunch of other things. And then he just ran a lot of correlation because of the randomness of the universe. One of them becomes statistically significant. And then, of course, he says, oh, this is what I predicted all along. You don't report everything else. You just report the thing that worked. And then finally, so they were looking at weight, cholesterol, sodium, so forth. Then 15 people, one subject was dropped. Why? Because we looked at him and he was not in the right direction. Then we say, oh, I remember him saying that he wasn't feeling very well then, therefore I'm gonna drop him. Therefore the noise is very, very high. The ones that don't go according to our plans, we just drop them and we make some uh, reasons for that. This is a study design, a recipe for false positives. Can you just imagine that nobody, none of these big media groups, you know, you can do exactly the same study. Just go and run the same study again, do this with a large sample. You've got millions of readers. Nobody did this because one person did this on 15 different people and 18 different outcomes of which he only reported one. So is this common? Does this happen a lot in our field in science? Unfortunately, it does. Remember Daryl Bem, Feeling the Future, the 2011 JPSP? He gives a lot of advice to young uh, scholars like you, students in universities. And this is what he writes. Which article should you write? There are two possible articles that you can write. The article that you plan to write when you designed your study or the article that makes the most sense now that you've seen the results. These are rarely the same. And the correct answer is B. No, it is not B. Uh, you need to follow the plan. You need to be very transparent about what it is that you plan to find and what it is that you did find. And, uh, you know, he justify this by making psychology more uh, exciting this way. But exciting in this case, just storytelling has nothing to do with actual science. Is it just Daryl Bem? No, this is more recent in 2019. Somebody from Harvard giving some advice in a published paper in eLife. But you do need to tell the truth. But in that truth, you can select what it is that you want to present of that. 
So this does not feel like science to me, and it's very unfortunate that some of our top researchers are still uh, framing a research career and the way that we do science in this way. Another case study uh, relating to priming. Uh, this is a very famous um, paper from 1979. Uh, as you can see over here, uh, this is the citation rate. So cited by 2,463 and still rising. Uh, a lot of students I still see from undergraduate and masters who want to do their thesis on something saying, priming is amazing because we've seen in the textbooks in our classes that this works. So let's just prime people, activate their mindsets, and then we'll be able to see all sorts of things. So over here, they manipulated, they activated a hostility by doing a sentence completion task. So you just plug in one word into a sentence, you unscramble a little bit, and then it's supposed to make you react in a certain way. One of the famous studies is if you prime people uh, with elderly words, then they walk slower from the door to the elevator or something like that in 1996. So uh, how about this? A lot of citations, top researchers in our field, would this replicate? Unfortunately, it did not replicate. So uh, one of the things that we try to do in the many lab collaboration is have a lot of labs, just look at how many people are involved in this in order to try and see whether this replicates or not. After 2000 and something articles have already done similar things and wasted all of, the, um, uh, all of the time and resources. And we came to the conclusion that uh, there is no support. Uh, methods do not produce a priming effect. Now, the thing is, we did not need a replication, a mass replication effort and so many labs involved because when we started looking and the actual statistics, we realize that these are impossible findings. How do we know that this is impossible? Here is a screenshot from a meta-analysis showing that Schroll and Wire 1979 had 80 participants and a Cohen's D, which is the effect size of 5.6. I don't know if anybody ever talked to you about effect sizes, but an effect size of 5.6, somebody tried to uh, make this uh, easier for you to see is something like the differences between Shaquille O'Neal and the average female in terms of height. So this is a very, very unlikely to the point of being completely impossible. And uh, we asked uh, one of the authors, Bob Wire, what do you think about this? And he says, yeah, this seems to be like an error in reported statistics. It's not just the statistics. It's not just that for uh, so many years, 40 years, we didn't even read the statistics. We didn't even look at the figures, because if you look at the figures, these figures are too perfect. If you run something with 80 participants and you have a four-way interaction and you get this kind of uh, graph, so four-way interaction for 80 participants, so noisy, so few in each condition, to get this kind of thing is impossible. It's too perfect. There's absolutely no way for this to happen. But for 40 years, we didn't notice this until we actually tried to replicate this. And a bunch of people much more prominent than I am are saying, you know, debating this on Twitter. All these are captures from Twitter saying Brian Osik, the director of the Center of Open Science, saying this, this cannot be. What have we done all these 40 years? Now we've just been citing this without actually reading the paper, looking at the statistics, looking at the figures. These are the results of the replication attempt. Just look at how many labs are involved. So each one of these is a lab that did the exact same experiment with a lot more participants. What you can see here is the zero. So if the confidence intervals overlap with the zero, there is no effect. So no, 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 no. Only one out of those was able to find support. But when we look at the meta-analysis effect, it overlaps with the no, so no support for this phenomenon. In DV1, dependent variable one, dependent variable two, no support for this phenomenon. So the conclusion is the replication efforts completely inconsistent with what it is that they did back there. And we really need to rethink what has happened in this process to make this happen. Now, a lot of people in the primary literature did not like this result. So they said, no, you got, you got it wrong. You know, so it's been 40 years, maybe the time changed it. Maybe you need to adjust this and do a conceptual replication. You didn't ask us for our advice on how to make this better. So please work with us. So we did this again, again, look at how many labs 
time number two. And not only did we do a direct replication, but we also did a conceptual replication with the advice of the priming people in order to find this. And then finding the hostile priming effect for close replication is exactly the same effect size, you know, 0 0.08 compared to 0 0.09, not only for the close replication, but also for the conceptual replication, which is even weaker. So even when you get them to uh, advise you, even if you do a, a conceptual application, it still doesn't work. Just look at all this waste. So many labs from around the world. All this. Of course it wouldn't replicate. Did you see what the, the, the figure was like? Did you see what the effect size was like? But we still, we waste millions. We waste so many hours of, of highly qualified researchers to pursue this finding. So I don't even know what to make of this case study, but it's, it makes me feel like a lot of waste and uh, very, very unfortunate that nobody noticed this for decades, obvious errors. And to me, this just shows that if 40 years nobody noticed this, then science is not self-correcting. We've been you know, asleep for far too long and we need to address this in a more systematic manner. We've actually done a lot of priming replications and all of these failed. And there's a lot more there since the last time, a year and a half ago, that I, that I did this, this uh, summary. I'm bringing this to you um, mostly because I want to um, tell you the reaction of this man. So perhaps you have heard of him, Daniel Kahneman, the only psychologist, living psychologist to uh, receive the Nobel Prize in economics. Um, so he created the whole field of judgment decision making, which is what I consider myself to be part of. I am a judgment decision making uh, researcher. Thinking Fast and Slow is a book that he wrote after he received the Nobel Prize. Uh, a very difficult book to read, I admit, even for me as a researcher. But at some point I got to it. I decided there was an audio book came out, so I need to listen to this. So I listened to this and the first few chapters were okay. But I got very alarmed when the fourth or the fifth chapter, chapter was talking about priming research, saying that priming research is the future of judgment decision making. So of course, this happened before BEM, before the science reform movement. Maybe Kahneman was not uh, you know, uh, aware of these issues. But when he became aware in 2011, just after the book came out, he decided to write an email to all the priming literature people and ask them, Please solve this because all I have personally at stake is that I recently wrote a book that emphasizes priming research as a new approach to the study of associative memory. And he's very truthful about this. Count me as a general believer. He believes in priming. And he asked them, please solve this because I can see a train wreck looming. There's going to be a train crash if you don't solve this issue with the priming literature. Why am I mentioning this to you? Because this is a blog, <clears throat> a blog that analyzed all the findings in thinking fast and slow to see what is the likelihood that they will um, <clears throat> replicate. So reconstructing a train wreck, how the priming research went off the rails. So basically what he was showing is that each and every priming study in that chapter uh, does not replicate. There's no way. It's just like small samples, very noisy. We don't know why it's in that uh, chapter. So Kahneman, who by then was over 80 years old, went on that blog and wrote a comment, which I found to be just stunning. And what he wrote was, what the blog gets absolutely right is that I place too much faith in underpowered studies. There is special irony in my mistake because the first paper that Amos Tversky and I published was about the belief in the law of small numbers. What he did in 1969 was to go to statistician conferences and give them this scenario over here, which is very, very similar to priming literature, showing a few in this condition, a few in this condition, something that is just below 0 0.05. Trust me that this works. He went to statistician conferences and showed the statistician placed too much faith in these studies. He warned the world about what he ended up doing. So if the king of heuristics and biases that warned the world against this is the one that finally failed to internalize its message, then what about us? What about the other scientists? 
the Nobel Prize winning scientists saw priming research as something that is real, when in fact the evidence was very weak. What to make of this? Problem is, John Barge, one of the priming literature people in 2018, so six years after Kahneman wrote this email, seven years after BEM feeding the future, after all the replication studies that I've shown you, did we change what we do? No, we need to write books and we need to publish a New York Times bestseller in 2018. Before you know it, the unconscious reasons that we do what we do. I don't know what to make of this. Very unfortunate. I don't think we have the time, but there's a, an interesting video called Interview with a Researcher. You're welcome to download the slides and then click on this to have a look at this. It's a very funny and sad at the same time kind of video about how we frame these kinds of things. Usually at this point, at this point, I show you how to do p-hacking. There's lots of simulations for that. Don't have time to do this with you right now, but if you want in some of the videos, I demonstrate hands-on how to do p-hacking and to show you that actually this is a very common thing that was until, you know, during my PhD, all of us did this. Some people still do this. Some of them out of ignorance, some of them with some subconscious bias, some of them because they need to publish papers. P-checker is a tool uh, that uh, you can use uh, if you're going to do a thesis, especially if you're thinking of uh, continuing to do research in industry or to do any kind of research in academia. Then first thing that you should do before you pursue, invest one year of your life or your entire life in a certain direction is make sure that it's credible. How to know whether something is credible or not. Use this tool. So for example, what you can do over here is put in all of the statistics from the articles that you're reading to make sure that the evidence is strong enough. So I'm actually gonna show you the strength of the evidence for priming literature. This is a tool that was not available when I was a PhD, but now we've created the science reform movement, created a lot of these kinds of tools. So for example, there's some data that people already inserted. So I'm gonna load some uh, demo, elderly priming. So this is the one that has to do with if you prime elderly words, then people walk slower. What is the evidence? So you can see from the different articles, people just put in the effect sizes and the p-values. And what you can see over here on the right is actually somebody can check automatically whether the p-values make sense or not. So you can see over here, it can flag all sorts of inconsistencies. Some of them can be quite minor like this, but in some of the literatures, the inconsistencies are horrific. So an automated tool, you just upload a PDF. You can actually go to uh, stat check. <clears throat> you can go to a, a website, you can upload the PDF, whatever article you're working on, and it will check all the p-values in, uh, in that article. Um, okay, so this is one of the tools that you have over here. What else does it do? It gives a meta-analysis. So I'm not going to explain to you in too much detail what is this funnel plot, but trust me when I tell you that this is very indicative of a publication bias. It means that there's a lot of things that should be here that are not published because the p-value is not lower than 0 0.05. So everything that was p-value above 0 0.05 either was not submitted to the, the journals or the reviewer said, or the editor said, we don't, we're not interested in something that doesn't show a result, that has no findings. So we can have this kind of analysis to see whether there's bias. And finally, we have some statistical uh, methods like p-curve to show what is the strength of the evidence. So if there's strong evidence, uh, then we can see this green line. Uh, but the problem is that for priming literature, it's the blue line. So 44% of the findings are just below 0 0.05. So it doesn't make uh, a lot of sense. It shows that somebody is trying to push the p-value just below 0 0.05. Does this contain any evidential value? It does not. If there is some evidential value, is it inadequate? Very inadequate. Is there any evidence that there was p-hacking, somebody was trying to push the p-value lower than 0 0.05? Yes, some indications for that. So use this tool 
in order to gain an understanding of the literature before you go and collect participants and, and do your studies on this. It's very important that you check the literature to see if there is bias in there. Are people really doing p-hacking? Yes. How do we know? Because they tell us. We asked them in 2012, how many of you are doing p-hacking related stuff? Everything here. Look at the rates. We asked them not how, how many of you are doing this, but are your colleagues doing this? So of course, less people saying that they're doing this. Of course, colleagues do a lot more. How many of the colleagues are doing these two practices? 100%, 100% of my colleagues are doing some of these questionable research practices. Falsifying data. How many of you are doing this? What to make of this? Very disappointing. Still happening. We ask students, master's students, undergraduate students, MPhil, PhD students, are you doing this? Doing this a lot. Why? Because we need to finish the thesis. We want our advisor to give us an A+. plus. We need to show that something worked and we didn't just produce noise. So students are doing this as well. We are to blame because we pressure you into these kinds of things. We don't let you know that finding nothing is important. You don't have to find something. We are the ones who are putting this pressure on you. So I want you to take that pressure away to focus on credibility and trustworthiness and not to do these kinds of things. How else do we know? When we look at how many published things are just below 0 0.05, we see this huge jump. So all this looks okay. 0 0.04, 0 0.03, a little bit increasing, and then most of the finding lower than 0 0.01. But then we have this jump in 0 0.05, indicating that people are really pushing their p-values just below 0 0.05 so that they can get published. Last uh, survey, 2020 in the Netherlands. Netherlands is supposed to be the leader in open science because they had some scandals, fraud cases, big, huge fraud cases in 2011. How many of them are reporting in 2020, nine years after the scandal, after BAM? How many are doing this? Fraud. How many are falsifying things? Reporting, self reporting that they're falsifying. 4.3. And these are the ones that are self reporting. Can you imagine how many people are just not saying that they're doing this? And then how many people are doing questionable research practices? 51.3. Did we really improve in the decade since 2011? It doesn't seem like it. Okay, so what's, what's the harm? What's the worst that can happen? So I wrote a thesis and I massaged some findings and then I did some p-values and all that. Who's going to care about my thesis? Nobody. But I'm going to show you an example, and this is not an atypical. So this is a more common example than you think, that sometimes it takes billions of dollars to reverse a bad finding, a fraudulent finding, a questionable research practice finding. So these are captures from Twitter about one case study took billions of dollars, hundreds of years in human resources to pursue a flashy finding that promised something that ended up to be nothing. So there are real costs to fraud. There's real costs for you to not making sure that what you're doing is accurate in publishing uh, this as if this is solid, solid evidence. Okay, so looks, looks very pessimistic, right? Uh, I agree that I did my PhD expecting to come into the field and science is just working, functioning. I did not expect to spend the first uh, five, 10 years of my career, my studies, my postdoc, and being a system professor having to deal with these. I really thought that things are worked up, but with all the disappointments, there's some opportunity for us to do better. You can have a science that's more solid than the one that I had to find. So um, we do need science that addresses these, these issues. Can we get back on track? Sometimes when I go and I give this talk, especially when it's uh, with senior people who have been in the system for a lot of uh, many years, they don't like the evidence that I'm showing them. They don't think it's a strong enough evidence. They don't like these case studies. And they say, there's nothing wrong with science because there's electricity, planes are flying, you know, we created a vaccine, science is functioning and working. 
what are you talking about? We can debate these kinds of things. I'm very happy to have this kind of discussion with whoever is willing. But my message to you is regardless of whether you agree with me or not regarding the evidence or the case studies, is that we just need to improve our scientific practices. We need to get rid of all the bad practices and we need to implement new practices. It reminds me a little bit of the debate about climate change and global warming. You know, we talk about things that we all want. We want clean water, air, we want livable cities, we want green jobs, healthy children. And then occasionally somebody comes up and yells, but what if this is all a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Let's just create a better world. Same thing with open science. You know, we all want more credible research, increased transparency, more applications, open access so you can access what you paid for. And then somebody comes in and says, but what if it's all a big hoax and we create a better science for nothing? It's a win-win. There's no bad aspect of open science. Let's just open everything up and then we can address some of these challenges. It's not only me that's saying this. It took us a very long time to get the world interested in this, but this year, finally, UNESCO decided open science is the way to go. We must address these challenges. I have to say that uh, this is one of the very few things, few good things uh, that came out of this pandemic, the very tragic last two years that we've had. But finally, the world, the world is waking up to understand that we need to change our ways. So how to promote open science? It seems like now open science is becoming the reality. If you plan on doing research in industry or academia, uh, by the time that you will enter these jobs, open science will be a reality. So you need to adjust to it now and prepare yourself for it. Um, different organizations, Singapore, for example, implemented state, uh, um, the statement for research integrity two years ago. Uh, there was, a, I think it's a hidden slide, uh, a conference here at HKU about the Hong Kong uh, open science principles. So change is happening. It's very, very slow. It takes some time, but the world is reacting to this. What can we do about this? One of the solutions is registered reports. So um, if you want a three hour version of what is registered reports, this is my uh, workshop on this. Started in 2013, don't know if you remember the name Chris Chambers, the guy who wrote the book, Seven Deadly Things of Psychology slash Science. He's the one who said enough with this. We have to change the way we do peer review. We have to change publishing. We have to change the way that we do science. So he introduced register reports. This is the broken model of peer review today. First, you do everything including the analysis, the results, and all that. Then you submit this to the journal. And then if the journal likes your findings, the p-value is lower than 0.05, or if it's groundbreaking, amazing, that they can get a lot of media attention, then they publish this. If not, throw this away to the file drawer. Lots of problems with this. How does register report solve this? Taking away all the outcome bias, the hunt type bias. So peer review is actually made on the plan. You don't have any access to um, outcome because there are no outcomes. You make the best plan that you can. You submit this to peer review. And the peer reviewers, instead of judging you and saying, no, 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 reject, they help you. They give you constructive feedback. When I show this to my students, the students are like, wait, what? Isn't this how science was working so far? I have to say, I'm very, I'm very sorry because we failed you. We implemented this monster. I don't know why, but this is the right way to do things. So before we conduct research, then we send it to peer review. And the peer review checks whether this is rigorous or not. We all agree on the best system. Once we all agree, the journal gives us an in-principle acceptance that no matter what, this will be published. And only then you start data collection. It doesn't matter if p-value is higher than 0.05 or lower than 0.05. If you follow the plan, in the second peer review cycle, they're not allowed to have new comments. They just need to check whether you followed the plan in the first stage or that you documented carefully the deviations and justify those. So finally, from this broken model of all these issues in the scientific circle, we get to a point where we don't have a publication bias because there is no outcomes when they evaluate this. It's based on rigor. We can ensure that the samples are large enough 
And we can address all sorts of things like uh, we can insist on open science, open research, we can insist on uh, accept and welcome replications. So registered reports really address a lot of these things. Started in 2013 with three journals that Chris Chambers was the editor. <laughs> and then slowly picking up, but nowadays you have more than 300 journals, 350 journals that will do register reports and will publish things in the new model. Still not science or nature, or PNAS, all these big publishers that are highly re reputable. Why? Because they're very slow and they want to make sure that the findings are, wow, amazing, p-value lower than 0 0.05. So this doesn't suit them. But for me personally, I aim for those that care about register reports. I want to implement this as much as possible. For me, this is a science uh, evidence pyramid. What is the status quo research? priming literature cited by 2,500 articles. For me, barely worth a mention. If I read something in the news about this or I see an article coming in this, it, for me, it doesn't mean anything. If there's a little bit of open science, like the data and the materials, the code was shared, then I'm willing to give this a little bit more weight. If it was pre-registered, there was a pre-registration plan, a little bit more, but it starts to get green uh, registered reports. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of registered reports. The medical sciences are a little bit better at that, but in social psychology, many of the other disciplines, we're just starting out to do uh, a lot of registered reports. And in a decade, we'll have enough in order to have a meta-analysis of registered reports. So this is by Chris Chambers. On top of that, I added that I think we also need to make the meta-analysis to be a register reports, and I give a lot of workshops on how meta-analyses are also biased and need to be open in a register reports. There's also some benefits for you. So let's say that you're a researcher, you're asking, but why would I? My promotion system and the way for me to get a PhD or the way for me to get a postdoc requires that I uh, do things the old fashioned way. Um, there's lots of reasons for you to do this because you can get expert reviews when it, they matter the most, when you can actually change things. So if you're not uh, confident, and I'm not confident that I'm the world's number one expert in what it is that I do, then you can get the scientific community to help you. So you can submit your plan and then people will help you to improve. The rejection rate for registered reports drops from 80, 90% in the traditional model to less than 10% in registered reports because there's no reason to reject you if you can still fix it in the plan. Right? If it's not outcome, outcome based. So more likely to be accepted in the first one that you uh, submit to. Plus it seems like for now, the evidence that we have is that registered reports are also better cited. So you can add this to your CV saying, you know, there's more. Um, plus the peer reviewers are much more friendly, constructive, helping you. Sometimes they're so good that I want to give them co-authorship, but at least if they're doing this in a model that includes open peer review, then it has citable um, peer review uh, DOI links that you can include. So these are some of the reactions. And there's also evidence that register report reduced bias because in the standard reports in our literature, 90, 95% are positive results, p-value lower than 0 0.05, which is impossible. There's absolutely no way that we're getting all our predictions at that rate. The rate for registered reports is a much lower than that, lower than half. We also did some randomized control trials to compare registered reports in terms of quality to the traditional reports. And just because peer review helps it to get better, then we can see that in terms of methods rigor, analysis rigor, or overall quality of the paper, registered reports are doing a lot better than the traditional uh, models. An invitation for you. All of my thesis students last year, all nine of them, masters and undergraduates, do register reports with me as part of their thesis. So we work on a plan together. We submit this to peer community in register report. They give us in principle acceptance at the end, which means that their thesis is published in a journal. So all of them did this. We already received eight out of nine we received in principle acceptance. The other one has a slight issue, but it will be published at the end. So all of them 
have in principle acceptance and are going to be published in peer community and register reports and collaborative psychology as the journal, an open science, open access friendly journal. There's lots of benefits for that. If you want to know how we do this magic, how can they do this in a one year period? You can talk to my students and ask them how this was for them. But they've done a replication of a classic finding in judgment decision making that is contributing to the general knowledge about that phenomenon. We know that what they're doing is credible because the peer reviewers, the experts in the field went over their articles, their thesis, in order to give some insights. And finally, when we get to the examiners, the second examiners who need to grade, nothing really to grade because this was approved, accepted for publication at a good journal in social psychology. So if you want to know more about how this happens, just go on my website or write me an email and I explain this to you, but all the students working with me on a thesis submit register reports, work with this model to get their thesis as a publication by the end of the year. Not only the thesis students, but also our team. So we have 17, I think 18 already, um, of, these, of these in the community working with this platform. And the nice thing about this platform is that it's really, it's completely open, everything is shared. Uh, this is how it looks like on their website. So this is the in-principle acceptance. So Chris Chambers was the editor for all of our 17 uh, submission. And he wrote this really nice summary saying, you know, you can publish this with any one of these journals that you want to. One of the journals after they saw this contacted us and said, can you please publish with us? And I'm very happy to, because that's a good journal that has open access. These are all the reviews. So all the reviews are open for everybody to see. So anybody in the world, can access what it is that we did, how we were reviewed, and establish our credibility. So really top notch open science practices by HKU students, undergraduates and masters as part of that. So addressing all of the challenges that I told you about before. We share everything that we do. So you can see how we responded to all of the criticism, all of the suggestions for improvement. We share everything, how we calculate the effect sizes, all our Qualtrics survey. As part of the plan, we simulate data as if it's real data, and we conduct a data analysis plan on that simulated data. So in the pre-registration, it actually looks exactly like a manuscript, only the data is simulated. Once we get the in-principle acceptance, then we just collect the data, plug in the new results, and the manuscript is finished. So you can have a look and see some of this. If you want to hear a bit more about peer community and register reports and what is register reports, strongly recommend it because for me, this is the future of science. Everything else before that, I don't know what to make of it. This is where we should be going. Still some weaknesses here that we're working on, but this is so much better than anything that I've ever seen. If I could do my PhD again, start my studies again, I would only aim in this direction. So you can hear Chris Chambers or many of the other recommenders talking about this. Highly recommended to go and check this out, some articles about this, so forth. So this uh, sums my presentation of the challenges that we're facing and some of the solutions. And to show you that actually here at HKU, the students working with me, the big team, we've completed 120 replications and extensions in judgment and decision-making. HKU students, are at the forefront of doing open science research. The rest of the world is looking at what we're doing here at HKU and learning from that. You can be part of that. You can talk to your advisor if you're doing a thesis and say that you want to work this way. When you're evaluating evidence, when you're planning how to implement best practices, remember the science pyramid. Look for register reports, look for open access, look for open data, open code, open materials. So just make sure that you're up to date with everything that's happening right now in the world and how to really establish that the evidence that you're basing your career on is really credible, trustworthy. That's it for me. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I don't know if we have time. Okay. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yes, please. Um, so study about the size thing. Yeah. Um, do 
those things get canceled or get removed, even if I can put it after and show that those might um, you know, that up. Yeah. So this is when we really realize that uh, human beings are complicated and some things are political. And sometimes I, I personally agree with you that I think this should be retracted. The way that the journal has ex explained not retracting this is that they want this to be part of the scientific historical record, showing that there is actually other replications coming a year or two after that, referring to that and canceling this. However, the concern is, I think you'll agree, that people will not find the replications and the classic finding will still be considered to be because we have all the TED Talks, the books, whatever came out based on that article that is not being corrected. Who goes to all these TED Talks and corrects them? Nobody does unless there's a retraction. Unfortunately, even when there is a retraction, that does not guarantee that the record will be completely corrected. But I agree with you that it should in this case, and it really wasn't, because JPSP, that journal, uh, has a different understanding of science and a, I would say, a political agenda that is not in line with people from the science reform movement. But a very unfortunate case. In some cases, uh, there are retractions. We've been uh, involved in some of those. Unfortunately, a very painful process. If, even if you find errors in the original studies to establish uh, that these are indeed errors and make sure that uh, these are not just uh, you know, uh, put under the rug and ignored, uh, a problem because we're not emphasizing credibility, we're emphasizing reputation, we're emphasizing alleged impact and there is a little bit of uh, po politics and bureaucracy in science so um, this is part of still what's uh, broken we need to fix this uh, unfortunately the BIM thing has not been fixed it's out there it's published anybody can access it. thanks for the question any other questions yes please yeah this is a very tough question to answer and uh, I have I have my own views on this but this is something that we're still trying to figure out it's a good question to ask yourself at what point do you stop pursuing a study so something has been studied in the 1970s has 2000 citations we had 40 labs from around the world twice failing to replicate this but somebody says but maybe there's still something there maybe a uh, different culture, maybe if you run this on Princeton students, maybe if you go back in time and run this again in the 1970s, maybe it will replicate. I don't, I don't know how to deal with this because I, we haven't set uh, uh, you know, the kind of uh, threshold to say uh, this means that this is replicable or not replicable, or this is trustworthy, not trustworthy. All I can say is I used to place a lot of value in what was published, especially if it came from a reputable journal by people that come from established, well-established universities. I used to think a lot of it, you know, coming to HKU, I need to teach these textbooks with all these findings. I used to think that I can just teach it and take it as for granted. I, I can't do that any longer. Uh, right now, I would say that if I have two pieces of evidence, one published before, long time ago, I don't know when, by some people before open science, but one was done. Many labs around the world, everything completely open, a registered report. To me, these are not comparable in the strength of evidence. I put a lot more emphasis on the more recent one. Still could be that if somebody runs this under some conditions, then perhaps there's still something there. I would strongly recommend that you don't invest your uh, time or resources in that, but instead try to follow up on some of what seems to be more credible. I mentioned that we did 120 replications and extensions. We completed about 80 of those with data collection, the rest are registered reports. And I can say that actually our success rate in judgment decision-making, where I focus on classics like Kahneman, our replication rate is closer to 70%. And in the things that don't work, we've actually identified on how to improve things. So it's not like everything is broken. I chose to pursue judgment decision-making because I had an intuition 
that things are better over there just because they're simplified. They're much more simple. I run things with choice set. Choose A or B, what do you choose? And things are a bit more transparent with larger samples. Uh, but this was, uh, you know, I could have been wrong. And uh, the evidence that I have right now is not comprehensive enough because I chose these classics. So I had some intuition. It turns out that 70% my intuition was fairly accurate and for the rest, uh, they're better. But what, what I want you to take away from this whole thing is that uh, there is a way of establishing credibility for an article that you read. Most of the things do not live up to the best standards that we have right now for open science. So when you look at an article, we actually have guides for this. Uh, maybe I should show you this, but uh, on my website, <clears throat> There's actually a lot of resources that you can use in your research. So for example, if you go over here to the resources and examples, we have a lot of guides uh, to how to calculate effect sizes, how to do things in Jamovi or R Markdown. So we have a bunch of these tools on statistical best practices, how to do replications, how to do a power analysis and so forth. And some of our uh, guides are on how to establish whether an evidence is credible or not. So evidence uh, pyramid is one of those, looking at open science practices, looking at replicability, looking at measurement noise. So there are all these different factors that would allow you to choose what is it that you trust uh, the most. So for example, let's say that you become the decision maker in Hong Kong in the next pandemic, whether to implement a vaccine or a treatment, yes or no, how would you establish whether something is credible or not? Go back to a paper from the 1970s based on a sample of 10, or use a registered report, open access, randomized control trial by experts, independent replications from around the world. So just to get you thinking about the aspects of evidence credibility, but we have to sort out when do we stop investing all these millions, billions of dollars and human resources in what is already published, but seems very unlikely. Good, very, very good question. I don't have a, a good answer for this other than best to focus on what we already know is in the right direction and implements best practices. Thank you for that. One more thing I want to show you, and I hope that this will become a more uh, common practice, and I want to invite you to do this kind of thing, is on my website, you can also see a section called the Check Me, Replicate Me. There are some people who openly call for other people to um, attack their findings. Do you make it available to other people to check your work, to make sure that they're solid? I want to know whether my findings are solid or not. There's a, an entire talk that I give over here about some of the errors that we found in other people's uh, research. So if I see, if you ask me which researcher is more credible, which evidence is more credible, I trust more the ones that have made every possible effort in order to make sure that somebody actually checks their stuff. So in terms of journals, which journals do we trust more? Is it because they're nature and science and high impact factor? No, it's because they insist on checking the data in the code. They insist on open peer review. They insist on making it available for others to check them and replicate them. Because this is science. All the other stuff is just a trust system. And we failed that trust. So you deserve this, not the trust system. Any other questions? Wow, you just summarized my last four years of trying to get uh, people to replicate more. <sighs> yeah, it's a problem. I used to think, I have to say that one of the encouraging things is that I really thought that we uh, won't, won't be able to publish our replications when I started doing replications with HKU students. So undergraduates in my courses at HKU the last four years have done replications. In one semester, we completed a replication from beginning to end. And finally, we submitted this to, to journals. So you can actually see that over here. <clears throat> it's called the Mass Replication Project. Uh, you know, I summarized this, so you can go and have a look at these talks. You can see all the publications that came out of this. So luckily, out of 120 uh, replications, 80 already completed, you can see that we published quite a bit of this together with the students. So the students and the teaching assistants are co-authors 
on this. Sorry, jumping. So we published around 28 of these. We have about uh, 11 more that 11, 12 that are in principle acceptance register reports. So it seems like it's getting not easy, but it's getting better for our ability to uh, get this into journals. I can't get this into science and nature, OPNAS or the top journals, but some of these journals are quite good and they are leading in social psychology and in social psychology, judgment decision-making, there are more and more journals that are willing to publish this. Even the ones that are not, <clears throat> we uh, put everything that we do on a platform called Open Science Framework. So that even if it's not published, it has a DOI. <clears throat> so I'll show you, for example, so there's this DOI, so you can cite this. And each one of the projects has the preprint, the data, the code, the materials, so that even if it's not uh, uh, published uh, in a journal, it is still has a preprint that people can go find it accessed and find everything and build on that. So to me, honestly, if it would just be me and not the early career researchers or the students, I would be satisfied with the preprint. But we have been trying to affect change in the journal publication system. So we are trying to submit these to journals, a lot of rejection letters, a lot of hostility, but there is some um, success in that. So I'm confident that maybe not the 120, but let's say if I get to half published, I will be very satisfied because we have this to complement in cases we get rejected. So at least as a community, we're able to correct a little bit or supplement additional evidence with our applications on the open science framework. Okay, if you ever want to talk to me, you want to know more about this, you want to join, we have a, a mailing list. You can subscribe to this. I am very active, me and other open science people, active on Twitter. Everything that I do, including hopefully this one, is gonna be posted on, on YouTube. But this is my email. If you want like direct one-on-one -on -one contact to know more, even if it seems like a silly question to you, how do I do a power analysis? Like you mentioned this, but I'm not sure where to find it. Use that email, let me know. I want to help you in your open science journey. Thank you.